Hello and welcome once again to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, the instructor this term, and this week we are going to be talking about the dramatic elements of games. We are once again in our book, Game Design Workshop, and talking about a kind of a complex chapter. We're going to go pretty fast, so if you need to, you may replay the video more than once. Um, let's talk about a recap of last time we had. We talked about Huizinga's magic circle that separates conceptual space from real space and that the player enters the magic circle by accepting the invitation to play. And uh, we talked about player interaction patterns like single player versus game and player versus player, etc. And we talked about game objectives. Some examples were the rescue or escape game, the construction game, the capture and kill game, etc., etc. And today we're going to be talking about dramatic elements. Those were the, um, this, these are the dramatic elements. And we're going to say all games, because they are games and not real life, they are somewhat abstract. Abstract means apart from the concrete realities of actual existence. Car town, you are uh, driving and collecting simulated cars. They are not real automobiles. And in Lazarus, those are not real boxes that are falling on your head and you are not really being squashed by them. Um, some games that you're very familiar with, the earliest games in human existence, very abstract, just rolling dice. That is an abstract game. It turns out numbers are pretty much the ultimate in abstractions. Um, Backgammon uses positions. Positions are a little bit less abstract than mere numbers or locations, slightly less abstract. All right, then there are some games that are a little abstract and a little dramatic, like chess. Chess uses positions and rules for movement and capture that are kind of abstract, but it has kings, queens, knights, and et cetera that have roles and powers, which makes them a little bit dramatic. Um, some games have very little abstraction and very heavy drama, like Darksiders and Red Dead Redemption. They have characters with personalities. They're fa facing tangible challenges. They're facing danger. They are very heavy in the drama. And in a previous lecture, we said that um, being good can be challenging, as in the example of the Fellowship of the Rings game. But risk can be challenging and fun at the same time. So let's talk about what we know about this thing called fun. We'll talk about Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly. And that is the correct way to pronounce that name. Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly was a Hungarian-American psychologist who specializes in happiness. He studied the activities that cause humans to experience happiness and found some interesting things that are important to us in the gaming industry. He asked hundreds of people about the activities that they enjoy. And Csikszentmihalyi found a pattern in these activities. Regardless of their age, their gender, these people all said the same things. They said that enjoyable tasks must offer you the chance to complete them. Enjoyable tasks must offer the chance to concentrate on them. Enjoyable tasks must have clear goals. That's a big difference from ordinary life sometimes. And enjoyable tasks must provide immediate feedback on whether you are successful or not. Again, very different from real life. Enjoyable tasks must be easily entered to escape everyday life as I can sit down and build a model battleship. 
pretty easily. And enjoyable tasks must, and this will be important to us later in the lecture, enjoyable tasks must provide us with a sense of control. Enjoyable tasks must also offer us, and this is a little harder to understand unless you've experienced it, they must offer us the temporary loss of self. You must kind of become more than your ordinary self when you are doing an enjoyable activity. Enjoyable tasks must alter the sense of time that is a symptom of an enjoyable task. Now, Csikszentmihalyi developed a theory that is very critical to the game industry. Among his other works, he developed the theory of flow. Everyone in our industry should understand what the theory of flow is. Flow, he said, was a state of concentration that is so focused that it amounts to absolute absorption in the activity. Thus leading to that uh, altered sense of time. So what he said was, players improve their abilities with repetition of your game as they continue playing. And the game challenge has a certain difficulty to it. And the player, brand new player, starts out playing your game. And if the challenge goes too high, too fast, before the player can improve in their abilities, the player becomes frustrated. A new player beginning a game where their ability increases and the difficulty of the game doesn't increase as fast as their ability, becomes bored. And a new player starting the game whose ability is increasing a little bit and the game gets more difficult and their ability increases and the game gets more difficult and the challenge keeps rising, they stay in that sense of flow. And games that achieve a good state of flow it turns out are much more enjoyable than games that fail to achieve a state of flow. And so here is the diagram from your textbook. Up here, the zone of frustration. The game got too hard, too fast. Down here, the zone of boredom. The challenge didn't rise quickly enough. Um, some of the games you've made, like uh, Evil Clutches, the challenge really doesn't rise. The random number generator keeps putting out the same thing. In Galactic Mail, if you made several different rooms and they were a little more difficult with each room, then you understand that you can keep your player in the state of flow. And a lot of the games you make this semester should keep the player in the state of flow now that you know what it is. Let's talk about games in the state of flow. If both of these games can have increasing difficulty as the player's skill increases, Lord of the Rings and uh, um, Grand Theft Auto 4, then why is that risky one more challenging? We're going to take a little nick out of that today. We probably won't completely answer the question. It turns out everyday life is challenging. And in everyday life can even be risky and possibly dangerous. But do everyday tasks always offer these things? A chance to complete, a chance to concentrate, clear goals, immediate feedback, the chance to escape everyday life, the sense of control, the temporary loss of self, and the altered sense of time. The answer is no, everyday life does not offer those things to us. Now, we're going to talk about the meat of this chapter, that danger is enhanced by dramatic elements, as in this uh, example from Grand Theft Auto 4, being chased by police. Dramatic elements in Evil Squares, the abstract version of Evil Clutches, where you've got this gray circle that you control that launches yellow circles that are representing fireballs. So you've got the boss in a creepy cave is a red square. They've captured your babies that are gray circles. The dragon must rescue them. That's a bigger red circle. The demons are blue squares, and they're trying to kill you. 
And you can launch fireballs that are yellow circles. All right? That's more on the abstract end than the dramatic end. You have to keep in mind, oh, that yellow circle is a fireball. The dramatic version of Evil Clutches, the premise of the game is implied. You don't even have to explain it to the players for them to realize that the, the boss is evil, you are good, and the babies must be rescued, and the demons must be blasted. Let's talk about this game, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves by Naughty Dog. I'm hoping that this video will play for you, and maybe that the sound will be heard in the room and in the television broadcast. Here we go. So in Uncharted 2. How's your 13th century Latin, mate? Where'd you get this? Borrowed it from the files of the nutcase. Mm -hmm. In Trebizond, we were set upon by thieves. Father, Maffeo, and I were robbed of our greatest treasures. This was written by Marco Polo. Yes, that much we were able to work out. Unfortunately, the rest of it's nonsense. Hey, hold on. So that it should not fall into the wrong hands, I concealed my great sorrow in the unlikeliest place. The light of the great Khan shelters the fate of the Thirteen. So I mean, it's just gibberish. He's talking about the Lost Fleet. Yeah. I know, someone want to fill me in? Marco Polo leaves China with 600 passengers and 14 ships loaded down with treasure from Kublai Khan. Now he lands in Persia a year and a half later with only one ship left and only 18 passengers. Now he recorded every detail of his journey, but he never told what happened to all those ships and the passengers. So, so somewhere out there, there are 13 ships loaded with the Emperor's treasure waiting to be found. Yeah, and that is what your client is after. Okay, that is the premise of Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, a very famously uh, written premise. It's one of my favorites. Let's talk about the dramatic element of character. A character is an agent that is used to show drama. That is the dictionary definition. A character um, in a game may be player controlled. Player may also be controlled by artificial intelligence. A character can. Or in the case of Lego Star Wars here, the character may be a mix of player and AI controlled. You can jump in and out of these characters in your party as you're running around. That's a pretty cool mechanic that's started to be used in games in the last 10 years or so. So that you uh, have an AI controlled character that can accompany you, but if you need that character's powers, you can assume control of that character. More about character. A uh, character may be a protagonist and sometimes a heroic protagonist. But not always a good character, as in the case of uh, our friend in Grand Theft Auto 4, um, where he's kind of a bad guy. An antagonist always opposes the lead character. The antagonist may be actually good, as in the case of the police in Grand Theft Auto 4. Characters. Um, Something game developers need to understand, you implicitly do, that novel writers and movie writers never had to worry about is the player controlled character may not always behave as the story intended. In this example of Lego Star Wars, here's the good Jedi Knight Obi Wan Kenobi um, at a Jawa sound, sand crawler, and the player can go around slaughtering Jawas. And that is definitely not something that, the, uh, uh, that George Lucas would have intended for Obi-Wan Kenobi to do. But most players do that. All right, let's talk about round characters. That's a concept we should understand. What makes a character round? A round character may have well-defined traits, such as our friend Link here, who is usually humble and brave when he appears in the Legend of Zelda series. A round character may also have a realistic personality, as in April Ryan from The Longest Journey. She had a rough childhood and is 
extremely reluctant to be a hero in that game. More about round characters. Round characters may undergo change during the course of the story. For example, Jim Raynor in one game he's on Arcturus Mengsk's side and in the next game he is opposing Arcturus Mengsk. That is a great change in that uh, personality and it's a kind of a famous plot point. Flat characters are the opposite of round characters. Flat characters, they undergo no change, they have stereotypical personalities. Often villains are flat characters. But not always. Yes, in Super Rainbow Reef and uh, in um, Evil Clutches, the villains are very flat characters, but in the games we're making, the heroes are pretty flat characters also. Let's talk about dramatic elements of story that could be built into a game. A story is a series of related events with an uncertain outcome. And a story will have a uh, plot that follows a dramatic arc. This is the classic dramatic arc that starts at the exposition, goes through the rising action, where it gets the highest point of narrative tension at the climax, and then goes through the falling action, which should make the viewer or player happy, and proceeds to the resolution. This shape has been used in storytelling uh, since time immemorial, including storytelling in computer games. Let's go over what plot is. Plot uses the dramatic arc. Plot is a plan or scheme of events that will be laid upon this dramatic arc. And that's a concept you should understand in developing games. Let's use one that you're probably familiar with. Lego Star Wars follows uh, the plot of the Star Wars uh, saga. Let's talk about episode four, A New Hope, the, which was the first of the Star Wars films. In the exposition, we meet Luke and learn about his life and his dreams. In the rising action, Luke learns about the Force, rescues the princess from Darth Vader's Death Star, has this great harrowing adventure. At the climax, Luke must face the Death Star. He goes against these impossible odds. In the falling action, Luke defeats the Death Star and is victorious. And so at the resolution, the heroes receive their medals from the princess. That is a plot laid upon a dramatic arc. Let's talk a little bit more about story. Many stories entertain via this thing called suspense. We have to be very careful with that. Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense, said the audience feels suspense when they believe they know more than the hero, they expect something bad to happen, yet they are powerless to prevent that bad thing from happening. He used that in all of his suspense films. Well, suspense will work that way in a novel. It will work that way in a film. It doesn't work that way very well in a game. Let's think about why. Games need to use a different formula for suspense because if the player feels helpless to intervene, which is exactly what Hitchcock was going for in his films, then the game will not be fun. Cheeks and me holly. Remember, he talked about that sense of control we have to provide. Cheeks at me holly said, only when a doubtful outcome is at stake and one is able to influence that outcome, can a person really know she is in control? And this is the outcome of a race in Super Mario Kart that we're seeing in that picture. Another bit of dramatic elements. The story in a game must rely on conflict. And the suspense in that game, and there will be a suspense in any game, is will I succeed or will I fail? 
at Darksiders or Plants vs. Zombies or any other computer game. And as we're wrapping up this kind of long and complex lecture, I want to leave you with this point. In the 20th century, screenwriters and directors learned the special storytelling techniques that were needed for films. And there are some great classic books about how to do storytelling in films and how to do screenwriting that I encourage you to read if you intend to be a screenwriter. In the 21st century, we are only just now beginning to learn those storytelling techniques that work in games. As I just gave the example of suspense, which was really critical for the film industry, can't be used the same way in games. We haven't figured it out yet. The question is, will you, taking this class, be the one to discover the storytelling techniques that are best in games, as Hitchcock did with films? There, it turns out, are only a handful of books on how to write for computer games. We may adopt one or two of them in future classes in this game design program. The question is, will it be you who writes the big groundbreaking book on how to tell stories in computer games? There are a few nascent books, but the real Bible of game storytelling, I believe, has yet to be written. And I'm hoping one of you writes it. All right. Next time, we are going to be talking about the system dynamics of games. Um, it's uh, kind of an abstract chapter, uh, but uh, I think you'll like it. In the meantime, this is Mike Substelny signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College.